Father, we're grateful this morning for the joy that we have to come to worship. Worship through song, worship through the word, worship in our praises, worship in our attention. And God, we pray that in all things that you would receive the worship that you alone deserve. We do pray that you would speak, to speak, O Lord, to us through your word. As Peter says, you alone, Jesus, have the words of life, so speak life to us today. And may we be the conduit of life to others. May our life be laid down for the sake of giving life, imparting life, gospel life to those around us. May we stir one another up to love and good deeds. God, may our lives be an expression of gospel love to those in our communities, those in our workplaces. Wherever you take us, wherever we find ourselves, Lord, may we be those who represent you well, representatives of life and truth and grace. May Jesus shine from us. May you get the glory and praise that you alone deserve. And so, Lord, in, in this moment, even now, we, we bow before you. We, we recognize that there is one day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But in this moment, in this moment, we begin that process. We maybe even continue that process that was initiated long ago where we bowed the knee in conversion and you called us in faith to yourself and, and now again we, we do it. We, we worship you as you alone deserve. And we ask that you would help us in the process to make it a continual expression, um, a perpetual activity of worship. As Paul tells the church of Corinth, that whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, might we do it all to the glory of God. In the big things, in, in, even in the mundane things of life, Lord, may we have you as the focus. You as the objective. You as the, as the supreme pinpoint in purpose for living. And might Jesus show up in and through us. So Lord, this morning as we come to your word again, we, we pray for the help as we prayed in that song, that you would speak to our hearts. You would help us not only to be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word, so that Jesus Christ might be praised today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, several years ago, uh, when I was living back in California, and even to maybe even date myself a little bit more, it was even before I was married. As a single guy going to the grocery store, to, uh, to pick up some food items, and, and, and out in California, living in a, a, a city called Manhattan Beach, or at least doing my grocery shopping there in Manhattan Beach at a grocery store named Ralph's. Now, just pause for a moment. Whoever thought it was a good idea to name a grocery store Ralph's, I, I don't understand, but uh, that's beside the point, and maybe not even applicable to the story. But here I was, I was in the, the checkout line, and I was, I was waiting to, to move out of the store. When, when I looked over to, to the side, and, and I saw this guy who was at a magazine rack. You know how they have that right there close to the, the checkout lanes. And, and he was at the, the magazine rack looking around. Now, you have to understand for context of this story and appreciate what was going on here, Manhattan Beach is a pretty affluent community. Uh, there are multi-million dollar homes in gated communities there. And, uh, and in the gym that I would go to, yes, I, I did go to the gym. It was a long time ago. But uh, when I went to the gym, there would be people uh, from sometimes from professional football teams, sometimes from the college football teams that were in the area like UCLA and USC. And people would tap me on the shoulder and say, do you recognize so-and-so who was there bench pressing 550 pounds and, uh, and, and me with the, the 20 pound and just going to town. But, but this is kind of the, the idea of, uh, of kind of the area that, that I was in. And so the, this grocery store, one of those kinds of guys was there at the magazine rack. He was like the width of a truck and uh, very intimidating. 
muscles bulging. He must have just come from the gym because I think the veins were popping out on every part of his body. And I, I noticed that he was looking at these magazines, but then takes one and tucks it in his shorts and pulls his shirt over it. That's kind of what you would do in uh, that day there in Manhattan Beach. If you didn't have pockets, because those kind of gym shorts didn't have pockets, you just kind of put things in the back. And, uh, and so that's what he did. And, and I saw this, and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world am I going to do? And a whole series of of thoughts flooded my mind in that split second. And I I looked over to my left. I could see the store manager. I I could just spot him right there. I knew that that was at least one recourse. What was I going to do? What would you do in a situation like that? Well, stay tuned towards the end of the message. We'll probably try to provide some resolution to this story and apply some of the principles that we learn in this morning's message from our passage today in Nehemiah chapter 4. You know, last week we talked about the, the need for, for faith, how faith overcomes fear. And we've seen that a number of times already in, in the people there living in Jerusalem. Well, this morning I, I want to take a look at the fact that, that faith is, is, is always accompanied by wisdom. And we see that there is a measure of wisdom that happens as Nehemiah is applying some principles of wisdom to the immediate situation and the people are, are acting out those wise things together. So if you join me, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 13 leading up to verse 15. This will kind of be the, kind of the, the passage for this morning. And, and then we're going to kind of build out some of the details from verses 16 to 23 as we're moving through it. And, and but we'll spend and concentrate most of our attention this morning on, on verse 14 and verse 15. Here's what it says. Nehemiah chapter 13, or excuse me, chapter 4, verses 13 to 15. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in the open places, I station the people by their clans, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials, And to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known to us, and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, let me just catch you up to the story. Now, the people of Israel, the Jews who were called the children of, of Israel, children of God. Uh, their father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been, had been given a, a covenant promise by the God of heaven. He promised to make them a people. But, but he had certain conditions on what that would look like. And, and part of that, and the first and most important thing, was that they would worship God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, the people of Israel were kind of... They kind of ebbed and flowed in their devotion to God. And and because of their consistent rebellion and idolatry, God sent the people into exile, into captivity. They became slaves in Babylon and then in Persia. Well, God began to send these waves of people back to Jerusalem. And there were three waves of of people that went back to Jerusalem. And and Nehemiah was part of that third wave. And he, when he comes... He understands the significance of the walls and how they're associated with the city of Jerusalem. This was God's city. This is a place where his identity would rest. These were his people. And Nehemiah prays for the condition of these people who were despised and full of shame. And and he asks that God would do something significant. So God sends Nehemiah back to Jerusalem. They begin to build the walls, but that's when difficulty begins. Well, here in our story, we've, we've been confronted by a, a number of, of different waves of, now of, of opposition that have been met and dealt with, and the people have gone back to work. But last week, we saw the significance of the people remembering the Lord, not fearing, but remembering the Lord, the great and awesome God, but in remembering the Lord, in, in trusting Him by faith. It didn't discount the need for wisdom, and that's what I want to draw out here, right here at the beginning of the message. I want us to understand the case for wisdom. 
that we as God's people have a responsibility to exercise wisdom, the, the wisdom that God gives to us. And we certainly see that here in our passage. The case for wisdom, and first I want to just take a look at and, and point out briefly from verses 16 to 23, the wisdom that we see in this passage. All, all the ways, and I think there's at least seven of them, the seven different ways, and there are probably more, that, that Nehemiah exercises wisdom with the people here in Jerusalem. Wisdom from this passage. First we see in verse 16, we, we see a distribution of the work. Notice that with me. Chapter 4, verse 16, it says, From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, and half held spears, shields, bows, coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind me, excuse me, behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. That's the first part of verse 17. Now, what may not be obvious in this translation and, and what stands out really from the, from the Hebrew text is, is notice the, the pronoun, my servants. Nehemiah is personally vested in this process. Nehemiah is personally divesting himself of his own personal protection, his own entourage, his own bodyguards, as it were, and he's spreading them out around the city so that they can now provide that kind of protection and help to those around, stationed around the city of Jerusalem working on the walls. We also find that, uh, that there are leaders involved. And the same word leaders is used in at least two other places that we've seen already. The first is used in chapter 2 where, where, where uh, Artaxerxes sends Nehemiah back to Jerusalem and he sends him with his entourage, which includes leaders or officials. We see that in chapter 2, verse 9. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen. That, that word officers is the same word for leaders that we find here in our text. I think it's quite possible that, that again, Nehemiah is divesting himself of the resources that he has. He's setting the example of helping to, sh to demonstrate a concern for the people in terms of their protection. It could also be used of the rulers that we see in chapter 3. On at least six different occasions, we find that there are rulers of half districts, some of Jerusalem, some of Keilah, some of Mizpah, and other cities uh, of, of individuals who are supporting the work there in Jerusalem. It's quite possible that these are also the officials referred to here in our verse. Either way, we understand that those who are in authority, those who are leaders over the people, those who were exercising some degree of, of, of ruling or, or authority in this situation are not running for cover, but they're setting the example of pressing in and guarding and protecting the people who are doing the job. This was a measure of wisdom. And Nehemiah takes every resource that's available to him and he deploys it for the sake of wisdom. In verse 17, we see that there's a, a measure of wisdom in relationship to alertness and readiness among the laborers. It says this, Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon in the other. Somehow this balancing act was taking place where, where, they, where they were able to, 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 to either pull a rope or carry a bucket or or. or carry some sort of burden with, with one hand and, and carry a sword with the other. There was alertness and readiness. Of course, it meant more trips. Of course, it meant less efficiency. Of course, it meant that uh, there was still more work to do. But it, it also meant that there was a sense of readiness among the laborers, those who were traveling to and fro. But that readiness of the laborers also is seen as readiness among the builders in verse 18. Each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who, who sounded the trumpet was beside me. In this task of building the walls, it wasn't possible to negotiate the, the placing of stones, the, the positioning there on the walls, or the securing them in place with just one hand. And so for those men, they didn't have their sword laying down on the, on the ground. They, they had their sword strapped to their side, ready to go as well. Each one was prepared. They recognized the danger that was in front of them, and they were ready to, to engage if, if there was a need. 
And I, and I love how Nehemiah puts himself right in the middle of the action. He has the trumpeter beside him. So if anything goes down, if there's any action or battle to take place, Nehemiah is going to be at the rallying point. He's going to be right in the thick of it. He's not sending them away from himself. He's, he's said, he says, bring it on. He wants to be right in the center of the battle. The next way we see wisdom show up in our passage is in verse 19 and 20. We see a battle strategy that has been predetermined and pre-communicated so that there's no ambiguity. It's not nebulous. It's not hazy. The people of the city of Jerusalem have a plan that they're ready to put into action. He says, I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us, our God will fight for us. If a skirmish breaks out, you hear the trumpet, run with all your speed to the rallying point and we'll fight, we'll fight together. We've been building together on this wall. It's been a unified effort. We're going to defend one another together. We're going to re remain unified in this purpose. Not only in building, but also in defending. We also see that they maximized the daylight, the, the work time in verse 21. It says, so we labored at the work. Half of them held spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. And so in order to compensate for the inefficiency, uh, half of the laborers who were unable to, to do the work because they were defending, and also only using one hand to, to carry these burdens, they maximized the, or compensated for the inefficiency by maximizing the time of the day that they worked. There was no travel time uh, um, in the way anymore, as we'll see in the, the next verse. They, they worked with all their heart. They, they did it with diligence. And here we find, in this, in this verse, just a desire to, to use all the, 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 the space that they could, all the time of the day, to get this work completed. Verse 22 is, they remained in Jerusalem. It says, I also said to the people, this is verse 22, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by the night and may labor by day. This, of course, helped to maximize their efforts, but this also added a measure of protection. Because now you don't have groups of individuals making their way uh, from the city to other parts of the, of the outlying areas and then getting picked off one by one by the enemy. There's a measure of protection as they can rest in the city and, and some who have been able to perhaps rest during the day can now keep watch at night while the laborers and the builders rest in the city, get some sleep so they can go back at it bright and early the next day. We find again in verse 23 uh, another means of wisdom it says in verse 23, So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. There was, again, some preparedness. There was alertness. We're not going to be caught with our pants down, as it were. We're not going to be vulnerable. We're going we're to minimize the opportunity for the, for the enemy to come and catch us off guard. We're going to remain alert. We're going to be ready for this. And it was good for them to exercise wisdom. It was right for them to be prepared. And it was right for them to expect conflict. They knew their enemy, and they were ready to go, even in trusting the Lord. Their God would fight for them. They just needed to be ready in the process. And as a result of their practical wisdom that they deployed, in verse 15 we find that God gets the glory. We find tucked in the middle of verse 15 that God frustrated the plans of the enemy. Their willingness to engage, their willingness to trust the Lord, their willingness to stay at the work, their willingness to be prepared in case there was a conflict meant that God got the glory. He was the one who demonstrated that he was able to fight for them. And in trusting God and practicing wisdom, God got the glory. I want you to recognize that, that wisdom is essential for us as believers. For not only because we see it in the scripture, we see it practiced by those who are heroes of ours in the Bible. But I, I want you to recognize that 
wisdom is godly, and wisdom is a portrait of the gospel. As we put wisdom to work, God gets the glory in our life. And that's point number two. Wisdom comes from God. Wisdom comes from God. He is the source of wisdom. He is the initiator of wisdom. He is the the wellspring of wisdom. And so when we put wisdom to work, we demonstrate that Jesus, that God, is the source of wisdom, and we call attention to him in the process. There's a number of verses that we could go to 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 help demonstrate this, but I've I've picked a few just just to give you a sampling. In 1 Timothy 1.17, This is kind of the the doxology of the Apostle Paul. He says this, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise. And there it is. He stands alone as wise. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And of course in James chapter 1 verse 5, we find that he is the source of wisdom. And, And if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. You see, God delights in in giving us wisdom. Wisdom is accessible to us. Because as we put wisdom to work, we call attention to the glory of God. He is the founder and source of wisdom. He is the giver and initiator of wisdom. And of course, we could go to the Proverbs and, and see the same thing. In Proverbs 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Since we recognize that that God is the, the source of wisdom, our posture before God, our worship, and our adoration of Him is where it all begins. It begins with recognizing that wisdom comes from Him, and as we recognize who He is, the, the first response is respect and worship of God as the, as the one who is the initiator of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. It's, where, it's the starting point. Know who God is. And then when that is in place, in Proverbs 2, verses 6 to 8, we find, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up Sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice. And he preserves the way of his saints. You want wisdom today? You can access wisdom. God is happy to give it. Just ask him for wisdom. But where do we find that kind of wisdom? Does he speak to us directly? Well, he does speak to us directly from his word. And that's our third point here. Wisdom is found in his word. It comes from God. It's found in his word. Psalm 119, verse 99 and 100. Two of my, some of my favorites in, in, this, in this passage. David says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I know what your word says. I put it to work in my life. And because of that, I'm a person who is wise beyond my years. Wiser than my teachers. Wiser than my instructors. Of course, in 2 Timothy 3.15-17, to 17, the Apostle Paul, in, in writing to this letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, says this, From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. Some total, the Bible which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine and reproof, for correction and instruction of righteousness, that the the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That work of wisdom initiated by God in leading us to salvation is a work that he continues, he progresses in our lives, he leads us to more effectiveness and fruitfulness as we commit ourselves to the scripture and he makes us ready and prepared for every good work we could ever imagine or want to do. So know the Bible, saturate your life in the word. Nehemiah 
knew the scripture. And he knew the God of the scripture. And in knowing the God of the scripture, he understood the features of wisdom. The characteristics of wisdom. And so he was able to guide the people in Jerusalem accordingly. That's what I want to look at next. I want to see some of the characteristics of wisdom that are put into work here in our passage in Nehemiah chapter 4. Faith in God does not dismiss the need for wisdom. We see it here all over this passage. The characteristics of wisdom. Again, backing up to verse 14 and verse 15, now we want to just begin to point out what are some of those characteristics. And there are, there are really two that stand out and, and provide kind of the, the guidance for us in relationship to how we know what is wise and how to put that wisdom to work. The first priority is found in verse 14 and 15. It says this, I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. Now, I want to just focus on the fact that priority number one is to love God and to fulfill his purposes. Love God and fulfill his purposes at any cost. Confronted with a danger, confronted with opposition, confronted with adversity, Nehemiah understood what was supreme in, in his objective, supreme in purpose, and that was to love God. To have a passion for his glory. We, we've been walking through these things week after week. And here we see it again. The priority of loving God and fulfilling his purpose at any cost. Keep things in the right perspective. Understand that, that this opposition was disruptive and potentially destructive. But pressing in and trusting God. Relying on him to help you carry out the priorities and purposes that he has laid before you as a people is the only way to, to exercise true wisdom. And we've seen this repetitively through, through the chapter 4 of Nehemiah. We see it in, in verse 1. Opposition comes, Nehemiah prays, and the people go back to work in verse 6. In verse 7, the opposition intensifies. The people pray in verse 9. And then they go back to work. In verse 10 and 11, we see more compounded uh, opposition. Now it's coming both internally and externally. Nehemiah calls the people, don't be afraid, remember the Lord. And then they go back to work. Conventional wisdom at this point might have said, well, we got the safety of our families to consider. We got the, our future livelihood to consider all of these things must be balanced and weighed and, and taken into, into perspective. And then, and then we need to take a look at, at, at the, the, the enemies that we have. Can't you see? We're outnumbered. We're surrounded. We're outgunned. We're outmanned. There is no way we can possibly do this. Let's just give it up and go home. That's maybe what conventional wisdom would have said. But divine wisdom says, remember the Lord. He is great and awesome. Our God will fight for us. Let's get back to work. Let's fulfill his purposes. Let's concentrate and focus on the objectives at hand. And that's what they do. They trust God and they press in to obedience. And thus try to, try to narrow in on and, 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 and um, fulfill that first obligation, that first priority. But that leads us to the second priority. Love for God is first, but love for others and seeking their welfare is second. That helps to, to, to fill out wisdom. Wisdom is directed towards God, but wisdom is also an outflow of love for others. Don't you see that in verse 14? Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. There we go. That's, for, that's priority number one. And then the second priority, and fight. For your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Not watch out for your own tail. Protect your own tracks. Watch out for yourself. Look out for number one. It's concentrate and focus on the people that God has put in your path. 
Look for their welfare. Look out for them. Find ways to preserve and protect the people that God has put in your circles. When you think about those that you love, who are around you, God has called you to wisdom and and preserving and protecting the people that God has put in your path. Work for God as your first priority, but then understand that in working for God, there are other benefits. Again, conventional wisdom might have said, well, if if I'm going to really look out for the people that I love, then, then the best way to do that is just to avoid danger. But that's why we need to have our priorities in the right place. We, we need to properly uh, prioritize these areas of wisdom so that we can begin to understand how loving our brothers and sisters, loving our sons and daughters and wives, how that, how that flows. The first priority begins to define the second priority. The work must continue. The objective of building the walls must advance in order to be obedient to God. And so, if that's the case, then protection and love for my family must happen here in Jerusalem. So however that plays out, it needs to play out within the right context. You know, I'm encouraged by the fact that that Jesus exercised wisdom in his dealings with people. There are a number of times that we find throughout the gospel record that that, that Jesus fled danger. Let me just point out several of those for you. We find the first in Luke chapter 4, verses 28 to 30. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. There he is. He is teaching for the first time, and, and the crowds are astonished. They marvel, it says. They, they are just absolutely amazed at how at how uh, authoritatively Jesus is able to teach. They're awestruck at the wonder of his ability. But Jesus then begins to say some things that turns the, the whole assembly on its head. And we find in, in verses 28 to 30, this, this part of the narrative. They rose up, they drove him out of the town, and they brought him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built, So they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Now, I don't know how that happened. But Jesus avoided danger. He was able to slip through the crowds. And he was able to continue his ministry. In John chapter 7, verses 1 and 30, we find another example of the wisdom of Jesus. And how he negotiated danger. This is now towards the middle of his ministry. Things were heating up in Jerusalem as we find in verse 1 of chapter 7. After this, Jesus went about Galilee. He would not go into Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. He knows how dangerous things are in Jerusalem. And so he he decides not to take this trip with his disciples into Jerusalem together. Instead, he kind of slips in under cover and goes there a little later. But then they find him in the temple. There he is teaching. Jesus just couldn't help himself. This is what the Father had commanded him to do, is to teach the people. So we find him in the temple, but, but in verse 30, they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. And then this phrase, because his hour had not yet come. God the Father had preserved and protected Jesus for the significant mission of the cross that he was going to carry out eventually. In John chapter 8, verse 20, we find a similar situation. The words that he spoke in the treasury, Jesus, as he taught in the temple. But, but no one arrested him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. And then a few verses later, the, the Jews, the, the Pharisees and the scribes were a little, a little peeved by the things that Jesus was, say, was saying. So it says, so they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus, notice this, hid himself and went out of the temple. And then a couple chapters later, Jesus has a way of getting these Pharisees all up in an uproar. And in verse 31 and 39, it says, The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And then verse 39, And they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Don't you find some encouragement in the fact that, that Jesus avoided danger? He, he understood the mission that the Father had sent him on. 
And in these situations, Jesus exercised wisdom to avoid the danger. Now, we understand that inevitably, as we find in Luke chapter 9, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew the mission, and on three different occasions, he tells his disciples what's going to happen there. Jesus didn't avoid danger to the, to the, to the effect that he, that he avoided the cross, but he understood the objective, and he followed the mission that the Father had put him on all the way to the point of sacrifice. We may not always know how to negotiate that like Jesus did. But we do have the directives from the scripture that provide some guidance for us in terms of, of how to exercise wisdom. How to engage in the various situations in which we find ourselves. How to honor God first, the first priority, and to love others as the second priority. Which will help to, to orient our, our decision making and provide some direction on on how we should respond in the various situations in which we find ourselves. But I want to just conclude our our time this morning in in, in looking at James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. I want us to see here the credentials of wisdom. If wisdom was to fill out a resume, if it was to to tell you its accomplishments, if it was to, to help you understand what you could expect if wisdom was put into practice, This would be the place you could go to find it. We find from from verse 13 that there are, that wisdom will show up in how you act. Notice James chapter 3 verse 13 says this, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. What shows up in our life in terms of conduct is an expression of the wisdom that we follow. And here we find two different kinds of wisdom. Two different credentials that we see in this passage. First, let's look at the wisdom from below in verses 14 to 16. Here's what it says. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Now, in James' mind, there are only two options. And and by the way, as believers, there are times in our lives where, where we put the wrong kind of wisdom to work or we put the right kind of wisdom to work whether we're listening to the world or whether we're listening to God. There, are, there is the opportunity for us as believers to follow the wrong kind of wisdom. And so James wants to help the people reading his letter to understand how to differentiate between the two. What are the credentials of the wisdom that is from below? Well, do you notice what it says? Well, how, how does he describe it there in verse 14? Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, pride against the truth, Disorder, in verse 16, every vile practice. Now maybe there's one word that kind of comes to the surface. One word that that would kind of define and quantify what's taking place here. And that one word in my mind is selfishness. Somebody who is self-serving. Somebody who does not consider God or consider others. Its priority isn't God-word and it's not others-focused. It's interested in number one. I'm going to get what I want, and I'm going to get it any way that I can get it, regardless of who gets in my my path. I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to strive for the things that uh, are going to fill up my satisfaction. The world is virtually invisible to me except for what it can do to help me get what I want. And that's the wisdom from from below. Notice how it's described. It is earthly unspiritual, and demonic. And there are times when we as believers put that kind of wisdom to work in our life. It is the kind of of wisdom that diminishes God. It makes God small and makes me very big. It's the the kind of wisdom that that, that doesn't recognize that that God is the great and awesome God. That He is the one who, who is able to fight for us. It doesn't It doesn't appreciate the fact that he is protector, 
that he is deliverer, he is savior, he is shelter, he is friend. He's not any of those things in that moment. Those are things that I have to do. I have to protect myself. I have to preserve myself. I have to get what I want. And so, in those situations, wisdom is earthly and sensual and demonic. But notice the credentials of the wisdom that come from above. In verses 17 and 18. It says, but the wisdom from above is pure and peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, it's a wisdom, as, as we see here, that's pure and peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of good fruit. What you should notice immediately about the descriptions is those descriptions can only be true in relationship to others. It requires other people to recognize the fruit of wisdom, good wisdom, the gentleness and sincerity and purity and gentleness that's in your life. It has an outward focus, first to God and then to others. And that's the kind of wisdom that we're called to, the kind of wisdom that that walks in the footprints of our Savior, Jesus. We could quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to us. And so those who emulate the wisdom from above are those who, who put to work a love for God and a love for others. So maybe we can use those credentials to to maybe evaluate the story that I presented at the very beginning. What would you do? How would you respond? How, how does a person who, who follows the credentials of wisdom from above now, now respond in the situation that I, that I uh, presented to you? How are you peaceable? How are you gentle? How are you open to reason? How are you sincere and pure? Well, do you just walk out of the store and and act as if it was no big deal? How does that relate to your, your pureness, your, your holiness, your blamelessness? Does that not make you somewhat a party to the, 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 uh, the theft that's taking place? <laughs> that's what was nagging me in my own heart as I was considering this. I, if, I, if I walk out of the store, I'm partially guilty. I can't do this. How do I exercise a love for God in this situation? How, how does wisdom help to, to guide me in this process? Well, I, 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 I noticed that, yes, there's a, there's a manager over there. I, I could tell the manager, and he could deal with the situation. And that would, that would relieve me a little bit. That would, that would deflect some of the responsibility, but still get the right thing done, right? And matter of fact, he's the, he's the, he's the authority here. But as then as I began to think, ah, what does love for others do? How does it open to reason and gentle and peaceable? <laughs> and so, yeah, I, uh, I, I tapped this guy on the shoulder, and um, he turned around and, and said, yeah, what do you want? And I'm saying, well, let's see here. As this big towering figure of, uh, of, of muscle um, begins to loom, and I, and I said, I... I saw what you did. And he said, you saw what? I said, I, I saw what you did. I saw you take that magazine and put it in the back of your shorts. He said, a magazine? You mean this? And he pulls out his wallet. It wasn't a magazine at all. What I thought was theft was just trying to put his wallet in the back of his pants so it would be concealed. I am so glad I didn't get the manager. And I'm so glad that in that moment, God helped me to exercise wisdom that was from above. May God help us as we seek to navigate this course of seeking to, to employ wisdom in a way that directs attention to the God that we serve. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you this morning. For the fact that you delight in giving us wisdom. You delight in directing us and, and, and instructing us through your word. And your Holy Spirit desires to apply wisdom to our lives. 
we recognize that there are times when we fail. There are times when we listen to worldly wisdom and we put that into, into practice. But might we, might we consistently look to God and seek to be about your purposes and seek to love those around us and seek to employ the wisdom that you have given to us from your word. We thank you for your patience with us in this process. May we emulate the same long-suffering and kindness and gentleness to those around us too. We praise you for this, and we ask that your glory would be seen through us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Go and and, uh, please the Lord through godly wisdom. Have a great day.